I will start off by just asking you co-authored the recently published report, Raising Standards, Data and Arti Artificial Intelligence in Southeast Asia. Um, can you tell us a little bit how this came about and um, what are your main takeaways from the report? Yeah, so I'm from Malaysia, Southeast Asia, and I wanted to focus on the region because there's so much talk about all things tech in Southeast Asia, data, AI, IoT, we love our acronyms in the region. But all that discussion is really just focused on economic growth. Economic growth, effective public administration, and the improvement of the quality of life through tech. But the lens through which tech is viewed in Southeast Asia is primarily through the first, and that's economic growth. Um, I like to call it sometimes, you know, a development by digitalization approach. And if you look at all the policies, blueprints, strategies uh, in all the different countries in Southeast Asia, you'll see that this comes through very clearly. So the metrics are all about how many people are online? How many people can we get online? How many people are using e-commerce platforms? What are the e-commerce values? But there wasn't very much discussion, still isn't very much discussion on what we might call social justice issues, um, inclusion issues. Yes, there is discussion now about how many women are going to be included in the digital world, how many STEM uh, female professors there are, how many STEM female students there are. But beyond these very narrow metrics of numbers, there isn't this conversation about what do we do about different perspectives, different worldviews, different knowledge systems that Indigenous communities in our Southeast Asian countries have. Uh, many of them are still fighting for very basic rights, like water, housing. But if you look at some of the Indigenous communities in New Zealand and Australia and in North America, their conception of data is very, very different. You know, they don't think that data should be commercialized. They don't think that data should be marketed and sold. Um, but we're not talking about this, even though we have Indigenous communities in our countries. And our models of what developments are, what regulations should look like, are often from what we might call the minority world, the global north. Uh, so if you look at the legislative frameworks in and around Southeast Asia, you'll see that many of them are modeled on the GDPR. But a lot of GDPR advocates will also tell you that the GDPR is not a good model necessarily for other countries around the world because of different contexts. Um, and so I wanted to explore what all these differences meant for a region like Southeast Asia that's often touted as, you know, this upcoming engine of growth for digitalization. Everyone looks at Southeast Asia as a market for growth. Southeast Asian governments sell the region as a market for growth. But if a lot of governments are also saying, well, the digital domain is meant to level some of that playing field to provide some of those social inequities that haven't been addressed in real life, then why are we not talking about these issues that we should be talking about? Um, and also finally, I just wanted to try to prompt people in Southeast Asia, whether government or non-government actors, to think about their place in the world when it comes to everything digital or data-driven technologies. Why are we not participating in more discussions at the um, ITU at the very highest levels or at the uh, International Standards Organization where rules and standards are being made for us to use in the region, but we're not participating in the crafting of those standards and rules. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you actually, because it's a huge report and I haven't read the full report, yeah. <laughs> but parts of it. Yeah. And you have done field studies and probably a lot of work in five different countries. Can you tell us how you chose the countries, how you worked on that? Um, yeah. So full disclosure, this project uh, was funded by the uh, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade of Australia. And their choice of countries really narrowed down the, the scope for us. There was no way we we're going to do all 10. 
in, in a year. So we chose the five countries that are in the report, Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, um, and Singapore. Singapore was not the original part of the, the grouping of countries, but I wanted to include Singapore as kind of a baseline uh, because Singapore is often seen as this you know, more mature country and economy uh, in terms of finance, but also digital. Um, and yes, it, it was a huge undertaking, nearly killed me as I like to joke. I need a 30 year break from that report now. Uh, but it took a year. Uh, we were not able to go out to Southeast Asia because of COVID restrictions. So we conducted a lot of the interviews online. Um, so because of the time difference, I found myself working, you know, 18, 20 hours a week, uh, working the full day uh, online and then logging on for interviews on Zoom. Um, but we tried our best to incorporate a lot of the conversations that we heard from um, not just policy people, but also like technologists, computer scientists. I would have loved to speak to historians, geographers and all that, because I feel that technology should be considered in a relational context rather than just a rational one. But uh, maybe we'll save that for the next report. <laughs> <laughs> And you talked about numbers before. So Southeast Asia is ranking third behind as a region behind China and South Asia in total numbers of internet users. And also it's becoming mobile first with 887 million mobile connections. Not about numbers. And I'm just curious because we say that there are those differences, but um, I assume there are first of all differences between the use of a smartphone from here, Europe or the US to Southeast Asia, but probably also in those different countries as well. Can you tell us a little bit uh, what those differences are and how they use yeah. uh, their internet connections and mobiles? Right, so you mentioned uh, the numbers for mobile subscribers, which far exceeds by about like 200,000, the actual population around Southeast Asia. Uh, the population right now in Southeast Asia is about 650 to 700 million. So, um, uh, sorry, that was, uh, yeah, yeah, million. So, and so uh, you can see that the number of mobile users, particularly in countries like Myanmar, uh, that basically leapfrogged the whole like wired internet, you know, that we were used to a dial up connection. You remember the sound, like, in the, oh, so excited to be logged on. Well, they skipped all that, right? And they went to mobile. Uh, immediately. And um, a lot of Southeast Asians use the internet and their mobile phone services primarily to communicate with each other, of course, but also um, they rely on social media for news, which may or may not be a good thing, but, um, and also uh, for e-commerce purposes. And, you know, you saw like over the COVID period, there were so many new subscriptions online whether it's on desktop or mobile, because people couldn't go out. There were countries that were under lockdown. Um, and actually, the speaking of economic growth, the number of um, e-commerce really just ballooned over 2000 and 2000, um, sorry, 2020 and 2021 over COVID because so many people were relying on online orders, online food delivery, um, and now, um, if you look at this one report that's often cited, uh, Google, Tamasi, and Bain and Company, they cite that the uh, valuation of e-commerce in Southeast Asia and only in a few countries in Southeast Asia is like over two hundred billion dollars, which is crazy for like maybe five or six economies in Southeast Asia. But again, we often take that as indicators of success. Yes, you know, the internet economy is growing, e-commerce numbers are growing, uh, but we're not looking at the other issues, um, how the internet, how data is being used um, to either bring different races and cultures together, how it might be splitting those uh, fragmented lines even further, because each and every Southeast Asian country is very diverse, let alone the region. And there are latent lines along ethnic, religious, cultural um, identities that are actually being worsened through things like AI. And we haven't begun to consider those fully. 
can you give us there some examples? So you said like a lot of the standards and they are copy pasted basically from right. from Europe mostly, but mm -hmm. also the US probably. What are examples of where this is a problem? So uh, with data, you see laws in Malaysia and Singapore. Um, Indonesia just passed their law, which is modeled very, very closely on the GDPR. And as you know much better than I do, privacy is key in GDPR. But the notion of privacy doesn't necessarily translate very well, say, in the rural communities, villages in some of these Southeast Asian countries. Um, and in my country, Malaysia, the, the privacy, uh, personal data protection commissioner has been doing these road trips around the country. This came out during one of our stakeholder consultations. And I was told that the commissioner has been going around doing uh, road shows and town halls to explain why privacy and protection of personal data is so important. And some of the responses he's gotten have been but why do we need privacy? You know, isn't it a good thing that we know what the other person is doing? I don't have anything to hide. You know, people know my name. Uh, so what if they know where I live or what my number is? And so I think in certain communities where neighborliness um, and the idea that you know what the next house is up to is a good thing, and like explaining privacy, even translating the word privacy into uh, local languages or local dialects can be problematic. So the idea that, you know, we, it, it's convenient, it's great that, you know, privacy and personal data protection is being pushed and rolled out in these different countries. But how do you translate those into local context is sometimes a problem. And you talk in the report about um widen the stakeholder participation beyond like the usual su suspects right. and can you first tell us who are the usual suspects <laughs> and who you think that should be included to yes. Like, yes. um yeah so the usual suspects problems. are uh, people who are involved in the tech industry people in governments uh, think tanks academics who look at these issues um computer scientists, those who design these AI systems and rely on data, data scientists, data analysts. But going back to my earlier point about tech being relational, because data is not just data, it's not just information points, right? You're missing the whole context of a person if you take personal data and just view it as just data. You're missing the experiences that a person has to bring to that data when you extract data at a certain point, you're missing everything else around it and you're only focusing on that one point. And so I think in that sense, we need to bring in, I mentioned before, I would have loved to speak to more historians, um, geologists, geographers who understand the environmental impact of having these data centers in different parts of the world and uh, parts of the country and land that has been cleared the impact of that on local communities, um, sociologists, linguists who understand what it means to have languages represented in AI. If you look at, there are communities uh, in the neighborhood of Southeast Asia that have said, thanks, but no thanks. We don't want you to include our local language, even if it's dying into your database of languages, even if your intention is to make it open access, open data, so that other people can learn more about our language. We want to keep it for ourselves. Um, I wish I could have spoken to indigenous activists who, again, conceive of data in a very different manner. Um, and all of these different sets of people, I think, bring a richness to the discussion that we're not having. Um, I also want to talk about some of the cases you looked at. And one, I think still timely, is uh, the one you looked at in Singapore uh, with the COVID-19 tracing app. Mm -hmm. um, so first, first, it was uh, stating that it was only used for contact tracing. And it was later revealed that the data could be accessed by the police 
uh, for criminal investigations. And can you tell us how the population react and how then the government react? Yeah. So the population, of course, was not happy because there were guarantees given by the governments that if the data collected would only be used for public health purposes. Um, and the ministers gave their word. And then when it was discovered that actually it was being used um, really to, to profile for future or, or present crimes, um, public was outraged. And the several ministers too, or in particular, had to apologize in parliament. And um, one of them is the Minister of um, Foreign Affairs, who also sat on the task force for these COVID apps. He said that maybe he might have been too ebullient and too optimistic about the power of tech. Um, and this was a bit of an oversight for which he was you know, deeply remorseful about. And so there was contrition that was offered. Um, and eventually what the government did was to leave that scope open for uh, data that was collected to be used to prosecute offenses, but they narrowed the category of offenses to I think about seven serious offenses. Um, so I think that was a, a compromise of sorts, I guess, because they couldn't have rolled back to where they started. Do you think the acceptance of these tracings, is it in Singapore or in other uh, Southeast Asian countries is different? From, from the one in Europe and the US? Uh, I don't know very much about European contact tracing systems, but in Southeast Asia now, a lot of governments have done away with contact tracing for COVID, but they have kept the apps uh, for other public health purposes. So for example, in Malaysia, uh, the app is called My Sajatrio, like it translates into something like My Welfare. And um, the Minister of Health has said, people don't need to scan the app when they enter buildings anymore, but because the data has been proven to be useful, they might widen the application to other public health purposes, uh, which of course caused a ripple of concern. But you know, again, we were assured of safeguards and, and um, security and protection of our data. So now you don't have the option to uh, opt out of certain features in the app. And to me, this is a bit concerning because if there have been data breaches and data leaks, significant data leaks in places like Malaysia and Indonesia on government apps and platforms. And once it gets out, it's not like you can rein it back in. So uh, I think these governments really need to look into how they use um, these apps. If indeed they're going to say, you know, we're not doing away with them, we're going to repurpose them for something else. You just mentioned it, data breaches, yeah. which is a big problem. And yes. which is also another example that in Thailand, but this wasn't a government app, but it was from a bank, so, the, so bank mm -hmm. data, um, including like corporate client data. That was that was stolen. Um, is this cybersecurity? Is the cybersecurity in Thailand or Southeast Asia lacking behind uh, Europe or the US? Um, and is this something that the government has to tackle, or is it also the private sector who should invest more? Yeah. How how can we deal with it? It's everyone. Um, cyber hygiene. What you do online is quite. Poor, the, the level of awareness uh, in Southeast Asia in general about how you uh, log into apps or how you use the internet in general, people are very lax about it. And uh, it's bad enough that we basically take agree to everything, right? When we have to use those apps, like those of us who, who should know better. But then there are also people uh, in Southeast Asia who feel that, you know, well, I have nothing to hide, you know, and so that's fine. And what's even more concerning is that with some of these data breaches, Indonesia being the most recent one, they've had a series of like major, major data leaks over the past two years in particular. There were a couple of major data breaches in Malaysia I mentioned. And in Malaysia, the Minister of uh, Home Affairs, if I'm not mistaken, actually said, 
oh no, sorry, it was the Minister of Defence. He said, this is not a matter of national security, don't worry. And I was just like, there was this cognitive dissonance. Like, what do you mean it's not a matter of national security when people's data is out there in the wild? So I don't know where this comes from. This, this comes from with this mentality of, you know, don't worry about it. It's fine. <laughs> Even if your data is out there, it's not going to threaten our security. So I think there has to be a mindset shift, but there also has to be effort. Um, there are education campaigns to raise awareness about how important it is to secure information online. But I think just in general, whether it's government or the individual user needs to be more aware of some of these risks. Do you also think that counties should collaborate more? Because, I mean, we do have that issue in Switzerland as well. There have been, like, uh, leaps um, all over the place past years as well here in Switzerland. So is this something that, that countries in Southeast Asia, but also maybe um, globally should collaborate more? Or Yeah, you saw the, the number of, like, cyber attacks and ransomware threats just rise, particularly over the COVID period, because so many people were online more. Um, and it's it's tough. Like we need to do our part as individual users, but also a lot of the cyber attacks are getting more sophisticated. So it's almost you know like one trajectory chasing another. There are um, obviously, like I said, government campaigns, both by um, sorry, government and public private sector campaigns that are being rolled out. But I think what will also help is that if those campaigns were targeted at particular groups, so like young children, for example, um, who are not necessarily under parental guidance all the time, even parents, I think, should be more aware, but also the older generation that um, are not so familiar, is not so familiar with technology and might require a little more guidance as to how to conduct their affairs online. And maybe going to the other part of your report, yeah, right, AI. Right. So the most interesting example, I think, is from Malaysia, yes. where there's a pilot where AI is used in the judiciary. Yes. Um, can I tell us how and how the reactions are to that? It's That is really interesting. And I'll contrast that with the case in Thailand. Um, so in Malaysia, there was a pilot program to use um, AI for judicial decisions. Mm -hmm. And some lawyers were really enthusiastic about it. Judges were also really enthusiastic about it because that meant cutting back on the backlog of cases. And this, again, goes to my point about like everybody being enthusiastic about tech being used for efficiency and growth. When I spoke to some people in the judiciary, you know, there wasn't so much a concern about whether bias would figure in into these decisions because it was assumed that the judicial decisions by AI would be based on precedent. And those decisions, the assumption is that they were made correctly. There was no need to go back and revisit them. And those decisions were not biased. And even if there was a correction for bias to be made, I was told like, oh, well, this can be done with proper training. But there was no awareness that maybe you had to look at the design of this AI system. Uh, what was it trained on? What kind of cases was it trained on? There, some of the criticisms that have been raised in the legal fraternity have been, we don't have enough of a case history. The case history has just been about 30 years. That's not enough to train algorithms to really make decisions that are not biased, um, that can probably never be a no bias case. But a 30 year case history is simply insufficient to train these decisions made by AI on serious crimes like rape, for example. These are criminal offenses. So, on the one hand, I think there's a lot of enthusiasm, and this is reflected in Thailand. You know, the Thai stakeholders we spoke to said that. Just anecdotally, you know, like by popular survey, a lot of Thais are very, very excited about judicial decision making by AI because they think that this neutral technology is going to solve all their problems. Uh, there is less trust in human beings in authority positions in Thailand because of their political history. And so 
AI technology is going to solve their problem because they would rather trust this abstract concept of technology than actual judges and human beings. Do you think this has potential for coming to come here as well, or is this something happening just in those countries? Or I mean, I don't I know. Don't, Are you I, looking at that in Europe? You know, I, judicial I didn't, I didn't. by AI. <laughs> Does somebody know? Is something happen like that? <laughs> I mean, I hope too, but I mean, there are huge problems with that, right? But or you can see the appeal for some, right? Because if you have a backlog of cases and decisions take like 10 years and the, the um, system just has to be prolonged, then that appeal of like shortening that time. But aren't those decisions sometimes biased and then the data going in? Yeah, as well. Yeah, I mean that's a, that's a serious consideration. But then it's efficiency over justice. Like if efficiency is also a measurement of justice, right? Then maybe that's that's justice being served. So again, what are we measuring? What are our metrics here? Are there questions in the room? Or maybe also just a reminder online. Um, there's the Q and A function, and please submit it there, not in the chat, um, because I'm only seeing the Q and A function. Thank you so much. It's a, a really amazing topic and huge. Uh, I, I, my knowledge of it is very limited. But um, so you mentioned that Southeast Asian governments seem to be proactively promoting the digitization, trying to get as many people as many transactions as possible to to happen into in the in this uh, digital space. But I'm wondering, we've been talking about data security, national security. What about the like finance flow? Because so the EU, for instance, is struggling has been struggling for a while to stop the you know, outflux of, of money really into the Silicon Valley, basically. Is that a topic in Southeast Asia as well, that there need to be you know, new forms of taxation or, or also maybe a question should also be how many of these digital tools come out of Southeast Asia and how many of them are um, foreign enterprises? I mean, I, I know grad by coincidence, but maybe there's much more than that. And um, then, yeah, well, maybe maybe just that for now. Yeah, so uh, that's part of the whole pitch that Southeast Asian governments make to the world. Come invest in us. We, you know, can build more data centers for data storage. We have the infrastructure in place. We are able to communicate internationally. Come invest in tech in our region. Um, there's a lot of uh, foreign direct investment that comes in, but there's also, as you pointed out, uh, some local unicorns in the region. Grab is one of them. In Indonesia, you have Gojek and Tokopedia, which merged to become GoTo. And uh, the prevalence of super apps in Southeast Asia is really quite impressive. If you've been there recently, uh, you'll see that everyone pays with their e-wallets. And to me, you know, I hadn't been back in a while um, for a few years. And that was such a strange concept to me because actually America, where I am based, is quite behind in that regard. And so just everyone paying with their e-wallets, like so much trust in technology. Um, there, I think there are countries like Vietnam that are very aware of the local potential for local champions. And you see really exa exciting examples happening in Vietnam. So in the report, one of the illustrations that we provide is um, the Vietnamese government and Vietnamese uh, private companies working together to address some of these gaps in the local economy in Vietnam. So Google came in and decided, you know, we want to offer uh, voice assistance in Vietnamese in the local language. They didn't do such a good job because they didn't really account for, and maybe this goes back to data sets, they didn't account for the regional differences in the Vietnamese language. So there are at least three regional dialects. And the uh, Vietnamese uh, huge company said, you know what, we can do better. So they provided their voice assistant that accounted for these local differences and context. Um, and basically like ran Google's uh, voice assistants out of business. And you will see that also uh, there are Vietnamese companies that are going into like genome sequencing using AI, for example. 
relying on data sets locally to try to predict and anticipate local diseases based on local DNA. And this isn't addressed internationally. And they see themselves, like if you go to their website, they see themselves not only plugging the local gap right now, but also expanding regionally and maybe internationally to provide for uh, markets in the what we call the developing world or the global south. So I think those are some of like the really exciting innovations that are coming um, out organically from within the region. In speaking of cyber security, how do you react to the hacking of the Iranian television that just happened with the news being broken into by hackers with um, supporting the demonstrations? I mean, it's not surprising. You have activism happening, right? The hacking by activists. Uh, whenever there is a political conflict around the world. Uh, you've also seen that in Southeast Asia, you know, when um, major tensions erupt on, on to the online sphere. Uh, for example, a few years ago, when the South China Sea dispute was really peaking, you saw hacking um, on, I think it was Vietnamese media, but also in the airports in Vietnam, by outsiders um, flashing messages. So I don't think it's surprising. I think it's really only to be expected. Um, and it's something that in the region we should really be paying more attention to. Do you know how we can address these problems or do we have like some solutions that to this problem? Like I said, right, like some of these attacks are just becoming more sophisticated. I think that the hacking bits, they're not difficult. Um, and that just requires like basic cybersecurity in some instances. Um, but the more sophisticated, complex, like ransomware attacks, for example, those are evolving and essentially like, quote, unquote, the good guys or the unintended victims have to play catch up. So no, I don't have like the golden solution for you. Um, it's just a very complex landscape now. So the good guys should start hacking themselves. No. Or... <laughs> <laughs> Actually, there's a huge debate on this. Um, you know, this idea of hacking back. Um, the private sector, particularly in the US, because they were under threat by some of these sophisticated cyber operators, were thinking about hacking back on their own. And a lot of uh, people who work in cybersecurity feel that it's a terrible idea because then you escalate the situation and it becomes a tit for tat uh, issue. And it completely destabilizes the internet for everyone. So, you know, you go through the, the proper channels, you, you do this through government, you do this through legal means, but the idea of hack back is attractive, particularly with to, to large corporations that have the means and capacity to hack back. But mm. it's potentially destabilizing for the whole internet. <laughs> so don't hack back. Okay. Thanks. Um, maybe as a follow up to the last one, I remember you previously mentioned that you don't quite understand where this, um, me, um, like mentality of it's not a big national security issue if people's data get leaked and stuff comes from. Um, if it is <clears throat> tied to governmental data, for example, especially when we look at South China Sea issues, um, is, did you find governments taking that, those breaches more seriously? Or could this be maybe a trigger point for taking that more seriously in the future? Yeah, that's a really interesting question because actually there have been uh, breaches into systems of government agencies, but also law firms that have worked on the South China dispute, South China Sea dispute to gain information. If you look at the historical pattern of those breaches around the South China Sea, you'll see that it started, and these are all open source uh, materials that I've gotten information from. Um, it started with trying to understand like how much oil and gas there is in the South China Sea. And this goes back all the way to like 2009. 
And then as it became more of a political issue and the dispute started heating up, the information collection was uh, targeted more towards governments, uh, particularly ministries of defense and um, justice departments. So that pattern of collecting information has changed over the years and so has the militarization of the South China Sea. Now these have developed in parallel, whether you can draw causal uh, dots between them is a question, but you can at least see that there is a parallel trajectory between information collection and the militarization of South China Sea. And there are questions now in the legal community about whether these types of activities, essentially espionage, right, information collection, um, should be considered breaches of international law. And at what point do they become an actual breach of international law if the landscape, or in this case, the seascape, has changed so much because of those years of information collection? So this is, this is a hot contentious topic, you know, like uh, what they call below the threshold activity cyber operations, particularly where political tensions are high. Second one, um, are you observing uh, something like a creation of national spheres in the cyberspace? Because we're talking about the COVID app in which um, I guess maybe something like a more like Chinese model of, of digitization is probably recognizable as opposed to a more like tech capitalism sort of digitization. Is what, what way will Southeast Asia choose? Will they have a more government driven digitization that ensures also maybe more of a lead in, in cyber or national security interests um, questions, or is it more of a sort of, well, tech enterprise driven digitization or overall? What we see in the region now is a mix of both, uh, depending on countries. And it's really interesting because you have countries like Vietnam that have laws that are modeled um, on Chinese laws related to cybersecurity, for example. But Vietnam is also party to uh, multilateral trade arrangements that are modeled on quote, quote, Western standards, like the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement on Trans-Pacific Partnership. And under those arrangements, Vietnam has obligations to liberalize their uh, data. And the idea of data localization is going to be reinterpreted because of these trade arrangement obligations. So you see kind of a divergence uh, in some of these arrangements locally at the national level, but also a desire, and this is what we found talking to people in the region for this report, a desire to come up with something more regional, um, like a third, fourth or fifth way. This is already happening in countries like Korea with a data governance landscape in India, which is giving countries like the US a huge headache. But there are examples, um, as nascent as they are, about countries not choosing models, not picking sides, and a desire within Southeast Asia to work amongst each other to come up with alternative approaches, whether it's to governance or to AI, uh, that replicate their historical experiences and present experiences and future aspirations more directly to them as opposed to, you know, picking and choosing and shopping around. So I have a fear question coming in via WhatsApp. And <laughs> so it's about, uh, so you're talking in the report about human dignity. And so the first question would be, is human dignity an universal or does it mean something else in the region? And then um, Josephine, my colleague, is wondering just um, how preserving human dignity can be fulfilled from a practical perspective and what it might entail. That's a really good question. I've been asked this question as well. What do you consider human dignity? So if the gig worker in Indonesia finds a method of employment and a method of earning income delivering food services for this giant tech company at the height of COVID, even if that worker is being exploited, 
isn't the opportunity to earn an honest living and an honest income a form of dignity? And this is not an easy question because on the one hand, yes, it is. But on the other hand, if that worker is also being exploited, then that dignity is also being robbed of that worker. One of the, I think, clearer examples is, I go back to Indigenous communities. There are communities because of the historical marginalization and oppression that they felt and experienced, and their relationship to nature and people around them, consider data to be an open concept, right? It shouldn't, as I mentioned, shouldn't be commercialized, it shouldn't be trademark protected. But their experience has also meant that their data has been appropriated. Their cultural identity has been appropriated. Now, if these communities choose to not participate in the digital economy, choose to not have their data included in this open data set for whatever purpose, then shouldn't we also at least consider honoring that choice as a part of honoring human dignity? And this is something we haven't begun to discuss in Southeast Asia because there's an assumption that participation in the digital economy is automatically a good thing. Why wouldn't you want to be a part of the digital economy if you can grow and prosper? I think we need to change that mindset and consider the possibility that there are people who might not want to be a part of that. Is this something we have to tackle as individuals, as a society, or is the government responsible as well? I think it's good to have a conversation at the societal level. Um, but you bring up a really good point because there is this tension between individual data and community data. And there are bits of this conversation floating around in Asia and Southeast Asia, not as much. But I think the more conversations we have about these different alternative aspects about data and data-driven technologies, the better we will be informed to make policy decisions. Again, we often borrow concepts from only certain parts of the world. There is really interesting scholarship being done in Africa, in Latin America, that is turning some of these concepts on their head. And we're not even including them in our scholarship, in our literature, in our policies in Southeast Asia. So we're missing out on the majority world's knowledge system and perspectives because we tend to only adopt and adapt models from certain small parts of the world. There are more questions in the room. Is that fine? Yes. Thank you so much. A very interesting views that you that you provide here. I I would like to come back a little bit to the privacy uh, and the statements that you made there. And I was wondering. I mean, there's there's different different um, positions you can take on, on on your data that you provide, and and we all I guess uh, actively provide data every day through the internet and buy stuff. And, and I'm a little bit torn uh, to one and the other side, uh, depending what uh, what the view is. So if I order um, coffee, I couldn't care, you know, um, the, the people to let them know how many capsules I order per week. Right. Um, I would care, of course, a little bit about my health data that I provide. But I certainly would also um, consider passive data that we provide. Um, because when we walk through the streets, you know, they're all uh, everywhere the cameras. And, uh, and the I, I guess the the challenge that we run into is um, it's not the single data per individual, but it's the aggregates that you you know where you can form a, a whole profile right. yes. of a person, and uh, and then if you even can track where the person is going because you know, the person has uh, his or her uh, mobile with it, um, uh, and on the other side you have all the cameras which you can use for surveillance, yes. uh, for instance, and then basically with the face recognition you know, can aggregate even more data. Um, and and furthermore, and, and you know, there's certain countries that actually make use of this. Um, you can use this, this data, this aggregate, uh, applying also AI algorithms uh, to uh, steer social behavior of an individual. And uh, maybe some people don't like a certain individual for a certain reason. And then they, you know, 
kind of try to correct their social behavior. And, and there are, again, countries that actually make use of this. And I, I guess there's some, some kind of a uneasiness if you, if you think about those aspects, not the single data of a single individual, but it's the whole aggregate mm -hmm. and the corrective actions that you can take based on such data. How, how do you see that developing in Southeast Asia? I haven't heard many discussions that take that view. Um, and even when people have tried to explain it that way, I think Southeast Asians are just, and of course I'm generalizing, but I think there's a lackadaisical attitude about the, the aggregation of data and what that means. The consumption of coffee. Well, people will immediately know that A, you drink coffee and B, like how much coffee you drink per week which goes to your other habits, right, from other points of information that they can draw a collective, as you said. But I just feel that um, Southeast Asians generally are unperturbed by this. You have a request for very personal information. So in Malaysia, we carry identity cards, and those cards have numbers, of course. I've been to massage salons where they've asked for my identity card number. And when you, a lot of people will, won't push back, right? They'll either leave it blank or they'll actually fill out those details. But if you ask them, why do you need this? They'll say, oh, you don't need to fill that out. Mm -hmm. But very few people actually push back. Um, and they don't really question like, what that data is being used for. So that's why you know the data protection commissioner has been going on these road trips trying to provide awareness about the importance of protecting data. But I think again, it's just a very different context. And um, a lot of these ideas about privacy, about consent, have essentially been grafted onto countries like Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia. And there needs to be a chasing up of explaining what this all means in the local context. Because how do you translate, I don't even know what the word for privacy is in Malay. Like, how do you capture that essence, you know? Um, I think I used this example before. The, the, con the, the notion of safety and security are both rolled up into one word in Malay. You don't disaggregate them. So it's very basic things like that. How do you translate concepts in a way that will resonate with local populations in their own dialects, languages, and understanding? That's what happens when you bring in <laughs> ideas. <laughs> of course. So I mean, um, on the one side, the privacy um, has um, also to do with freedom. Mm -hmm. You know, I can do things which the others not necessarily need to know. Mm -hmm. And um, and uh, coming back to the example of uh, governments uh, having the opportunity or the possibility to steer social behavior. Let's assume I I'm crossing the street at the red light and the system will recognize me and said, oh, you, you know, you've done something bad and we will correct you. So we are not allowing you to buy a ticket for the tram to go up to Remishtar City. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you have to walk. <laughs> I mean, would, wouldn't, wouldn't such examples, I mean, yeah. if you tell the people, look, this is actually what's happening elsewhere, yeah. wouldn't people become a little bit more aware of what can happen if you provide too much data on a, on a too broad spectrum? The appeal of efficiency usually trumps that. And if you've been to Southeast Asia, you know that we're not so big on enforcement, uh, fortunately or unfortunately. So the threat of saying, well, if you do this, it'll be counted to your other actions. People will just kind of laugh it off like, oh, it's not going to happen. <laughs> Maybe in a few years' time. But um, that flexibility, shall we say, of enforcement sometimes works actually quite well. But obviously, there are risks um, and challenges if like, stricter enforcement were to be done. Kind of talking about this usage of data, um, 
whether the differences actually, because now you talked a little bit about Malaysia and Southeast Asia in general, but I assume there are differences in at least those five countries mm. you did research. Right. What are those? Uh, a number of differences, actually, particularly in the details of the, the laws. Um, that's a really interesting question because there are common threads that run throughout the like data protection laws, for example, and that's because a lot of countries have chosen to borrow from the GDPR. So you have a master template, so to speak. Some of the differences go to uh, the details again of whether privacy is a human right or not. Interestingly, in Indonesia, if you read the Indonesian version of the law, you'll see that in the preamble, if I'm not mistaken, definitely on the first page, first half of the first page of the legislation, it says that it is a human right. And I remember speaking to uh, some experts as part of our research for this report. That was part of their explanation to sell this concept of why protecting personal data is important. Because people were saying, oh, that's a Western concept. The idea of privacy and personal data doesn't really exist in the Indonesian context or historical context. And um, legal scholars in Indonesia were pushing back and saying, no, actually, you know, this is a very Indonesian concept. And they provided specific historical examples pre-colonialism to sell this idea. And I think that is why it's reflected at the very front of that legislation that privacy is a human right. You don't see that in some of the other pieces of legislation relating to personal data in other parts of Southeast Asia. And then the idea of data localization. So in Southeast Asia, Vietnam and Indonesia are seen as you know, these problem children when it comes to data localization. Um, some of the other more open economies don't impose that requirement. But if you look more closely at, again, the pieces of legislation in Vietnam and Indonesia, you'll see that there is a real effort and struggle to maintain that sovereignty of data, again, because of historical experiences. And this is why I say the inclusion of his historians is important to understand that colonial context and why some countries act the way they do. Um, they're struggling with opening up their economies to investment for economic growth, but also how to preserve that sovereignty um, of theirs through data. And understandably, right, these are huge markets, Indonesia and Vietnam, huge markets. If the data of you know, Indonesians and Vietnamese are going to be open for all, who is going to win at the end of the day, given existing power dynamics? <laughs> Is there another question? I think we do have time for one more question. Yeah. Um, I just have a follow-up question about something that you mentioned earlier on, saying that um, one really uses existing um, forms of, of this beyond from African countries or Latin American countries, and that one sticks to what's kind of already there. But why is that? Why is one just letting such a big chance pass by? What's the reason for that? I feel that part of it has to do with our education patterns. Um, all but one of the 10 ASEAN member states is a relatively young post-colonial nation. Uh, so in Malaysia and Singapore, we are exposed to English language documents and we naturally look towards our former colonial masters for better or for worse, for models. Uh, in Indonesia, similarly, they have a stronger national identity though. But we never look at um, the other parts of the majority world. This was a term taught to me, by the way, because demographically, the majority world is what we might call the, the global south of the developing world. And with the failure of, you know, the, um, the or the petering out of momentum of the Bandung Conference, the Asia-African solidarity movement, post-colonialism, 
I think there hasn't been the similar tendency to look at other parts of the majority world for inspiration of ideas. You don't also have those um, like towering figures or thinkers that you had at the height of post-colonialism for various reasons. And so we look at, in Southeast Asia, we look to models of progress and development, mainly in the West. Um, and I think this is a, a relic of our colonial past. So you said it in the beginning, you just finished this huge report and yeah. you would have loved to talk to more right. people. Yes. Um, so what is coming up next for you? I would love to. We actually, um, I've had really good feedback about this report, and people have suggested numerous ways to continue, uh, like a sequel to this report. Um, I would love to delve into the impact of technology, data-driven technologies, in particular, on people. Uh, so, people, the planet, the environment, um, and power. So, looking at what the gig economy does to people, how um, can companies in Silicon Valley are attempting to quote unquote neutralize accents of customer service centers in like the Philippines or in India so that it better serves clients in the US because otherwise it's very hard to understand different accents. Um, what data centers do for the environment, um, what submarine cables do, Submarine cables are also a relic of colonial times. We don't often think of it that way. And um, power, what that means for capacity and agency and autonomy of Southeast Asian states that are increasingly being caught by these great powers. Um, and yeah, I'd love to focus more on learning from African, Latin American scholars and just trying to inject a new perspective that I think we have robbed ourselves of, frankly. One last thing about that, the idea of private-public partnership, right? We, and I am guilty of this too. Like, that's a great thing, you know? Public and private sectors should collaborate together because that's the way we harness our various uh, capacities for, for good. And I was talking to a historian friend about this and he said, think carefully about this because it was public-private partnerships in the past that led to the colonial period. It just blew my mind. <laughs> so, you know, these phrases that we often toss about, and I'm very guilty of that. We need to think a little more critically and, and constructively about what we mean by some of these phrases. <laughs> I think we are right on time. Okay. So, thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much.